It's Yankee Yarn Time. Time to hear another story of New England, presented by Alden Hall Blackington and brought to you by the friendly First National Stores, New England's largest retailer of fine food. Tonight, on the eve of the Easter feast, Blackie brings you an inspirational story of a famous church in New Hampshire and a woman's courage and fortitude in connection with it. Friends, as this has been a holiday in many New England towns and cities and a lot of First National stores have been closed, we urge you to shop early for your Easter food requirements. Tomorrow will be a very busy day at all First National stores, and it will pay you to shop early for the best selection. You can make it a real Easter feast by serving one of First National's plump, selected northern turkeys. Luscious, juicy, meaty birds, all fresh arrivals for the weekend. Also, don't forget, extra Betty Alden bread for the stuffing. And now, let's hear from Blackie. Good evening. When it was announced yesterday that President Harry Truman and ex-President Herbert Hoover would speak over the combined radio networks from 7 to 7.30 tonight, Mr. John Vandercook and my good friend Fulton Lewis, Jr. gleefully announced they would take the day off and tend to their spring planting. I'm glad Yankee Yarns escaped being forced off the air because tonight's story about New Hampshire's famous Worcester Church is not only appropriate for Good Friday, but the woman who made it famous found by experimenting that she could live as far as food was concerned on less than $20 a year. Her name was Elizabeth Hopper before she married Mr. Monmouth, who went off and got killed in the Civil War. And right after that, Elizabeth came back to Canterbury to keep house for her father, Dr. Hopper, the leading physician in that part of New Hampshire. When he died, he left her the farm in what was then considered a small fortune. Refusing to sell the place because she loved every shingle in her ancestral roof, Lizzie rolled up her sleeves and went to work. She pitched hay, sawed wood, put up preserves, and took boarders and would have done all right if she hadn't listened to a slick-talking traveling clergyman who promised her 20% interest on her money if she'd let him have it to invest. She let him, and you can guess what happened. The poor woman woke up to find herself saddled with a good-sized house, shed, barn, and the things that go with the place in the country, and not a nickel to her name. Her neighbors said, You better sell out, Elizabeth. You're only banging your head against a stone wall. You just can't make a place like this pay. But with more courage than good sense, she said, Well, let's figure it out. I get $20 a year for my hay, $12 for pasturing, $3 for apples if we have a good year. That's $35. I can earn $15 more by making paper flowers and sewing socks for the shakers. That's $50, Mr. Tolman. Of course, she added, I'll have to pay $10 for taxes, but that will leave 40 whole dollars to live a year on. You can't do it, Lizzie. You know you can't. Mrs. Monmouth smiled grimly. I can sew. And rather than sell my old home, I will. And that evening after the chores were done, Sarah Elizabeth Monmouth sat under her hanging lamp with the sandwich glass prisms on it and figured out a budget that would make $40 cover the cost of living for 365 days. As she scribbled, she talked to herself. $20 for food, 13 for fuel, that makes 33. Why, that only leaves me, only leaves me $7 for books and magazines. I guess I'll have to cut my food allowance to $17. I couldn't live without books. There was no mention anywhere of such things as shoes and dresses and hats and other trifles that women folks think they have to have. In her book, Living on Half a Dime a Day, Mrs. Monmouth says, I had bedclothes enough for comfort, but my personal wardrobe was in low state. I couldn't buy a pair of shoes for four years, and it was impossible to buy a single article of clothing. That didn't faze her a bit. She just ripped the lining out of an old dressing gown, pressed it, reversed it, sewed on some flowers from another gown, and she made an Easter suit out of her bed tick. Let me tell you about that bed tick dress. After the straw was pulled out and the cloth cleaned and pressed, she sewed on some strips from a pair of overhauls that the hired man in left as trimming. At some distance, she said it looked real stylish, almost as good as gingham, and it wore like iron. The shoe problem was solved by hiding her one best go to meeting pair and making substitutes out of an old pair of rubbers. She took the soles of some old galoshes, lined them with flannel, and lashed them to her feet like sandals. Making serviceable stockings for a New Hampshire winter wasn't so easy, but Mrs. Monmouth was resourceful. She dug around, down cellar and up attic and out in the shed, and found several garments on the way to the rag bag. A shawl and some under things that had been woven by hand when her father's sheep had whitened the hills, were tenderly unraveled, dyed with bright colors, and knitted into warm woolen stockings. Nights when there wasn't a scrap of food in the house, nor hardly enough oil to read by, Mrs. Monmouth would look at her six pairs of warm woolen hose and say, Thank God for stockings. When spring came and the flannels and woolens got too itchy for comfort, Lizzie made another tour of the attic, 
and this time it was an old red and white tablecloth that became a wrapper. The matter of an Easter bonnet was no bother at all. For five years, she didn't wear any, but she knew all about them from the magazine she read when propped up in bed by her little stove with a half a dozen hot bricks under her feet and a sizzling soapstone at her back. When Mrs. Monmouth allotted five cents a day for food, she overestimated it. It didn't cost that much every day. And with the money she saved, she could buy a spool of Aunt Lydia's number nine black thread and a card of wooden matches, even a gallon of kerosene now and then. She used a lot of kerosene because her lamp stove was easier to use and less expensive to run than the cook stove. Now, with all of this talk about saving food in the air, I thought just for the fun of it, I'd check up on just what she did eat and what it cost her, not counting, of course, her own vegetables. So here's her market list for an average day. One-fourth pound of yellow corn meal, one cent. One-fifth pound of dried beans, two cents. Small piece of salt pork, two cents. Five cents, all told. But that amount of food would last Lizzie two whole days if she didn't sneak a snack at bedtime. Sometimes she'd eat a whole week, 23 cents. Buying, for instance, two loaves of baker's bread for 16 cents and a gill of molasses and a pinch of ginger for seven cents. About once a month, she had one cent's worth of butcher's trimmings for meat boiled with two cents worth of barley and three cents worth of potatoes, and that made her a boiled dinner. But it was too expensive to have very often. For dessert, Lizzie used rice and oatmeal with a drop or two of molasses to perk it up. And once a month, she made donuts, three of them, fried one at a time in a tiny tin cup over her oil stove. On Thanksgiving and Christmas Day, she splurged on gingerbread, saying, it don't seem right not to have something special on Thanksgiving Day. Saturday nights, she says in her book, I used to lie in my cot thinking about the big pots of baked beans and brown bread and deep dish apple pies that all the folks up and down the road were having for supper. I'd go to sleep and dream of piles of cakes and cookies and custards till I'd wake up and have to, have to read a book to take my mind off of all that food. Well, some of that good country grub did find its way to Mrs. Monmouth's empty cupboard. The Shakers, for instance, were very kind to her, bringing the only delicacies she ever enjoyed. Once, Brother Sullivan showed up with four quarts of blackberries in a bucket. Lizzie poured them out in a pan, and she ate two quarts without stopping. But that was when she was living in the Worcester Church that I almost forgot to tell you about. Now, if you want to see the Worcester Church in Canterbury, New Hampshire, go up the long hill to the Shaker Settlement, and you'll see the spire on the brow of the hill just beyond. It was locked up tight last summer when I was there, but through the windows I saw some of the decorations that Mrs. Monmouth had left. Originally, this was a union church, built with the combined efforts of the Baptists and the Congregationalists, and it thrived until 1870. And then, like a good many other New England churches, it started downhill. One of its members, a man named Gideon Ham, had left $2,000, the interest of which was to be used for hiring a reader if no regular minister could be employed. And that's how Mrs. Monmouth comes into the story. One day in October 1871, when she was reading about the Great Chicago Fire, she came across a stirring sermon by Henry Ward Beecher. It was an appeal for funds for the folks who'd been burned out. She grabbed her cloak and cane in the sermon and started for the Union Church in Hillville, seven miles away. And as luck would have it, there was no preacher that Sunday. So Mrs. Monmouth occupied the pulpit as minister. And so eloquently did she read Mr. Beecher's sermon, a collection was taken up right then and there, and they gave her the money to send to the Chicago fire victims. Charged with her personality, the board members said, Lizzie, we have $100 a year, you know, from Deacon Ham's fund that we can spend on a lay reader. Do you want the job? I'll not only read for you, she said excitedly, but I'll fix up this dear old church so you'll never know it. And she did. For seven long years, she toiled to transform that box-like barren building into a place of color and beauty. She spent three times what they paid her for a salary on paints and pails and brooms and brushes, and she did all of the work herself. Only one thing bothered her, and that was how to cover the cracks and the stains where the rain had come in. I have it, she said one night. I'll mask them with mottos, hand-woven mottos of yarn and worsted. I'll make flowers and stencils and frescoes. And so, by the limited light of her old kerosene lamp, she worked off until daylight came, straining her eyes, cutting, pasting, painting, weaving the unbelievably intricate and beautiful designs that have attracted thousands of visitors to the Worcester Church of Canterbury, New Hampshire. She staged parties and concerts and lectures and used the money to buy a new stove and an organ for the church. She had the church roof shingled and the chimney fixed. And every Sunday morning, there was some new floral surprise for folks to look at while they sang their hymns. With wire and glue and paper mache she made enormous urns that held calla lilies six feet high, and the old, ugly brass chandeliers became baskets of beautiful roses, with twining vines so real everyone thought they were growing. She hid the cracked and crumbling plaster with pictures, religious, of course, and handmade mottos, 48 in all, 48 of those handmade mottos. Over the organ loft, she put her masterpiece, a Mount Zion motto, six feet high and ten feet long with raised gold letters against a background of blue. 
It was while she was engaged in whitewashing the choir loft that she met her first misfortune. The stepladder broke, and Lizzie fell, injuring her right arm and hand so badly she was permanently crippled. During her convalescence, she tried, poor thing, to continue her worsted work, but it was difficult and painful. In fact, it was almost impossible. The meager light from her little lamp was so poor, she kept straining her eyes all of the time, and finally, she completely lost the sight of one eye. If that wasn't bad enough, word came that the man to whom she had entrusted her money, the minister, had flown the coop, and there she was, penniless, half-blind, and crippled. Did that stop her? Not so as you'd notice it. Every Sunday, she was up at the crack of dawn, had a little tiny breakfast, not enough for a bird, then she'd walk seven miles uphill most of the way to read her sermon at the Worcester Church. And under her one good arm, there was always something new and bright and cheerful that she had made to be hung on the dingy walls. That woman had spunk. But there came a day when Mrs. Monmouth was no longer able to walk from her farm in the valley to the church on top of the hill. Why not fix up a room here in the church, she asked. Then I can stay here all the time and work. And so in due course, a couch and a table and a stove were brought in. And there Lizzie lived, acting as janitor, interior decorator, official guide, sexton, Sunday school teacher, preacher, and night watchman. Those were the happiest days of my life, she wrote in her book. There were always footsteps on the winding stairs to my little room. Children with wildflowers coming to rehearse their songs and pieces before the concert. Neighbors bearing dishes of good things for the minister to eat. She loved to go up in the steeple and sleep there on summer nights close to the stars. She always went there the night before July the 4th to watch the rockets and the bonfires and hear the cannon and the far-off bells. Well, sir, after serving that church for seven years, she retired to her old home, Rest Valley. But a week before Good Friday and Easter, she'd climb the hill again to make sure that everything was neat and clean and ship in her beloved Worcester Church. Today, that famous church is closed most of the time. And faded and gone are the flowers and mottos that Mrs. Monmouth made. But as long as that chapel stands against the green hills of New Hampshire, folks will go to Canterbury to see it and talk about the wonders of the Worcester Church and the brave woman who lived on half a dime a day. Thanks, Blackie. Before you leave, can you tell us a bit about next week's Yankee yarn? Well, as soon as I get my breath, I guess maybe I can. Next week's story is a very romantic one that I'm sure all of you will enjoy. It's a mystery story from Castine, Maine. That's fine. We'll be looking forward to hearing more about it next Friday at this same time when First National Stores again present Alton Hall Blackington and his Yankee Yarns. As we stand on the threshold of the first peacetime Easter in four war-torn years, First National Stores join with thousands of New Englanders in hailing the Easter festival, symbolic of the light and hope and peace of the world. May this Easter, with its ever-living promise of resurrection, be a most joyous one for you and yours. Join us Monday and every weekday morning, Monday through Friday, when First National Stores bring you the Women's Radio Journal, helpful entertainment planned for you by your radio journal editor, Lida Hamilton. This is Westinghouse.